So I guarantee you that the things that I say in this video are going to be unlike probably anything you've heard before, and it probably will not be something that you will initially agree with because you've never heard this precise stance argued, I am going to assume. But I want you to hear me out anyway in that the vision um, that is sketched out in John Michael Greer's novel Retrotopia, uh, which Alan and I have been uh, trying to discuss for the past couple of weeks, we actually, um, I don't want to say we get off topic, but we have real discussion instead of just reading um, from a script, which is what academic conferences do. Your professor will probably fly a vast distance to bring a printed out essay and just read the damn thing word for word and then have people ask questions that are really about themselves disguised as questions about what they just talked about. And that's a nice little game that they can play and waste a lot of money and energy doing it as long as it, um, as long as they're able to, but it won't go on forever. And we'll have to return to real discourse, real discussion. And one of the things you get with real discussion is the ability to say things that go outside of the list of accepted positions. Um, so one thing which lies completely outside the scope of acceptable positions is exactly what the title of this video is, a future with no internet. I can't think of anything more unthinkable to, to people than that. On the contrary, what we hear all the time is how the internet's going to take more and more and more of our lives until it gets everything. So of course they project that by 2030, the entire world is going to be run by Google. And then um, guys like Ray Kurzweil uh, say that, well, as the computers become smarter, it's not the people, it's the computers become smarter over time exponentially, they'll be able to solve even problems like death. So the only reason that we die is humans aren't smart enough to figure out how to cure death, but computers are smart enough or they will be in the future. So Ray Kurzweil tells us that, well, someday we'll all just be downloaded into um, this virtual space where we live forever as disembodied virtual subjects in heaven. And what is heaven like there? Well, it's the virtual experience of uh, of constant um, drug um, indulgence. It's like being high on a super strong drug for all of eternity in a secular version of heaven. And obviously, that's never really going to happen. Uh, it fulfills a strictly religious function rather than being anything like a realist projection of what could happen. But because of its religious significance, it does convince a lot of otherwise intelligent people to believe that it's possible. And I think that the reason for that is we have a dysfunctional way of talking about things like technology. We always say that no matter what the problem is, the solution will be technology. You have problems in education, just invest in better technology. You have problems in healthcare, just invest in better technology. Um, and the question is, is this a thing that really exists? Or is it merely a symbol with religious significance, which as a symbol gets a lot of psychological powers invested into it, rather than being an object that you can evaluate objectively um, as you would any other object that's not caught up in that web of uh, psychological projections. For example, in Christianity, the cross is a symbol that has a lot of emotion projected onto it, right? In uh, Hinduism, you have the icons of gods like Ganesh. In um, the ancient pagan religions, you had the literal sort of statues, right? And the question is whether today in the civil religion of progress, which is a religion in every sense of the word, despite having no gods, because having gods is not a requirement to be a religion, okay? Uh, as a civil religion, the belief that progress is always going to happen and that it's always going to benefit us is something that is unquestionable in uh, both modern America, really within the whole world now. And one of the most powerful symbols for progress, one of the proofs that it's still happening and that it will always happen and it will go on into infinity is this thing called technology. But does that really exist? We talk about technology in the singular as one unquestionable thing, but in reality, there is no such thing as technology in the singular. There are technologies in the plural. But if you accept that it's a plurality of different things, everything changes. And that's what John Michael Greer's argument hinges on. If you accept that there are technologies in the plural, it's now no longer just supercomputers and nuclear reactors and satellites and space shuttles. Um, 
that are that count now it's even like a stone axe because keep in mind a stone axe is an artificially created thing which you create for the purpose of accomplishing some task that you preordained uh, there's always a teleology inherent in technologies they solve problems that the maker intended them to solve whereas nature is not quite like that okay nature doesn't exist to accomplish a task that we want it to accomplish it's uh something which is the antithesis to how um uh, to how technologies function. And um, the problem with the myth of technology in the, in the singular is that if it's one singular thing, which the media is always talking about, you have to accept um, all of it or none of it. Okay. If it's one singular thing, you either accept technology or you strip naked and walk in the woods and you reject all of it. But the reality is that there is no, there isn't just one thing which you either accept or you don't. It's actually a plurality of technologies. And if there's a plurality of them, that means that you have choice. This is the most heretical thing, despite the lip service we pay to freedom and choice and all these other things as moderns. It actually is the most heretical thing you can say that technology is something that you can choose which ones you want. This is the big theme in um, Retro Future by John Michael Greer. If I could recommend you to go out and buy one book, it would be that one, which really changed the way I think about everything. Um, after I got it last year, I actually canceled my cell phone and took a long break from social media. And I found that um, far from uh, missing out on everything that was so exciting, I was actually much less bored because actually – Using social media, despite the fact that it would seem to be the ultimate cure for boredom because there's constant simulation, it actually makes you more bored. If you log into Twitter or Facebook for the 50th time in the past hour to see if there's anything new posted or if whatever, if there's any new memes to share, um, it actually makes you more bored. There's this strange paradoxical sense in which it makes you more bored and it also steals more and more of your time. That's why Jay Leno made the joke about the world's oldest woman finally joined Facebook, to which he said, it's proof, and that proves that uh, no matter how old you are, it's never too late to waste what little time you have left on Facebook. And um, one, one study came out saying that the amount of time the average person wastes on social media in a given year is enough time to read 200 books a year. And if you don't believe that, one of my coworkers proved that that was actually true when she was in prison and obviously not using social media all the time, um, she was able to read 500 books in two and a half years that she spent in prison. And certainly I put this to the test myself um, when I stopped having a cell phone, quit social media, all of that. I was able to read quite a lot while I was actually at work. Uh, I re remember being a medical courier where there are periods of like an hour, sometimes more than that, where you have no job to do. You're waiting for another order to come up to pick up a box of blood and take it to the hospital or whatever. And the other drivers I've, I've noticed, they always just get on their cell phone and they scroll around. They get really bored really quick and they get very irritable after about an hour of doing that. But I would just take out a book and an hour of screwing around on your phone while you're waiting for an, uh, an order is actually agony. It's, it's um, ironically enough, kind of like torture, right? But having an hour to whip out a book from the library, which you've been wanting to read anyway, like I read a lot of books by like Bart Ehrman at that time, a lot of like historical Jesus studies, which is really interesting. And I was able to read a lot of Bart Ehrman just at work waiting for orders to come in an hour to read that. That's actually a good thing. And it's this paradoxical sense in which the smartphone and a book um, are, are two things which we're told the smartphone is always going to be more entertaining simply because it's a newer technology. And you don't have the ability to choose the, the obsolete one. We were told by the media uh, about 10 years ago when Kindle came out that there would be no more printing of books. They would all have to declare bankruptcy and go out of business uh, because obviously Kindle had made all of them obsolete. And yet the opposite really happened. Kindle has now become not the hottest new thing that's put books out of existence, but in a lot of ways, a kind of boring device. I mean, I still use it for some legitimate purposes. Like you can get the complete works of somebody uh, from the 18th century for 99 cents, you can get a lot of ancient books for like free. So it has a legitimate purpose, but uh, it did not prove to be more satisfying than good old fashioned books. 
despite the fact that it is more advanced in the sense of more computerized and more dependent on these costly manufacturing processes, etc., and certainly it's newer in time, but the idea that you could enjoy an older technology um, and that it would actually do a better job for you of providing the same thing is so sacrilegious that we can't even think it. Okay, the media has conditioned us to believe that questioning whether the newer technology is better is equal to saying blasphemous things about Jesus in the Middle Ages. You could be put to death for it. And certainly if you think I'm exaggerating, uh, there was a news article about a woman in Oregon who lived in a Victorian style house um, that was built in the Victorian era and still used it as a Victorian style house. She wore the Victorian clothes and um, still used the older technologies in there rather than modernizing the house. And it was a very idyllic and, and nice story. And yet the reaction from many people who read it was to send her death threats in the mail because the idea that somebody could question the forward march of progress was so sacrilegious that uh, the reaction to a heretic in the Middle Ages that we have to burn that person alive at the stake because they're contradicting our ideology is something which even your most secular modern person still has about the same reaction to anyone who questions the forward march of progress. And also this idea of technology as um, um, probably more than anything, the internet. Uh, the idea that there could be a future with no internet by choice, which is the theory of retrotopia, not the idea that the internet collapses um, on its own and becomes unusable to the people who legitimately want it, which is a scenario that will happen in the far future. But retrotopia is about a, a group of people who willingly give it up because the costs outweigh the benefits. Um, it's something which is unthinkable to people today but if you examine it on rational grounds, it really does make sense. And the premise of Retrotopia is in the year 2065 in the United States, uh, the U.S. has splintered into a group of distinct nations. Uh, the Northeast is the Atlantic Republic. The South is the Confederate States or the Confederacy. And then um, Ohio and you know some of the surrounding uh, Great Lakes region is the Lakeland Republic. And the narrator of the novel takes a train ride for the first time in his life from uh, Philadelphia to Toledo, Ohio. And he finds when he gets to the Lakeland Republic that there is no internet. And it's, be it's by choice because during the second civil war, they found that having internet was a vulnerability rather than a benefit. It opened up, of course, certain new capabilities that are positive, but it also opened up a set of vulnerabilities and the idea of cyber attacks happening during war where I guess you could shut down a dam um, or you could shut down the electrical grid, whatever which is not just science fiction, by the way, that actually is a real possibility for the future of warfare, was something for which they found that rather than trying to update and update um, and keep it, uh, afloat of the threats to their infrastructure, they were better off just turning off the machines. They were better off just turning off the internet and living without it. And I remember having a dream uh, a couple of weeks ago where Mark Zuckerberg um, had um, infiltrated my smartphone and made it incapable of uh, functioning. And I spent the whole dream trying to get it to work. And then I realized at the end that the solution was just to turn the damn thing off and live without it. And it's one of those things that is both obvious but unthinkable to most people, kind of like the way that monkeys get trapped in Southeast Asia. In the jungle, as you put a piece of fruit in a hole uh, that is just big enough for the monkey to put their hand through when it's open, but too small for them to get it out with the fruit. And most monkeys will not think to let go of the fruit if the hunter's coming with a, with a net or whatever, they'll try to hold on to the fruit and still get out. And that's about the situation that most of us have found ourselves in with regard to if the problem is all on a machine, rather than take the obvious path of just turning it off and living without it, we try to find some way to get our hand out with the fruit. And the Lakeland Republic finds that letting go of internet really does not mean letting go of very much that would have been done without it. If you think about all of the things that we praise the internet has done, allowed us to do for the first time in history, like send email, 
as though there was no postal service. Um, even in, you know, the days of the Pony Express, I remember in the nineties when getting letters from people was still a pretty big deal. You would check the mailbox and there'd be a letter from grandma or a letter from your friend from school over summer vacation or whatever. It was a, it was a very, um, uplifting thing. If you read novels from like the 19th century, uh, the, the anticipation of the character waiting for the mail to arrive and looking at the letters was a really big thing that happened once a day as opposed to getting a notification on your phone instantly every time you get an email right and the joy of getting to read those letters was so great that you had whole novels of letters like uh samuel richardson's pamela it's not pamela as one of my professors claimed um there's a whole novel of letters and the idea that you know the internet might might make it faster but it does not actually give you anything new in fact most emails are actually very um shallow and not that fun to read in comparison with the kind of deep and thoughtful letters that i remember back in the 90s and certainly which you know novels from the 19th century show and um the idea that the internet also allows you to buy things remotely is not actually new. We had catalogs where you could place orders. Even back in the 90s, I remember getting these catalogs where you could place an order, fill out a card, and mail it, and you would get something. And that's not really a new thing, and it's not dependent on the internet to do. It might be faster, but not everything is just to be measured in speed. Uh, the other thing in the internet that allow the, the internet allows you to do, which seems new but really isn't, is um, sharing pictures of cats. We can just do the old-fashioned way of developing photos, send them in the mail. I remember that, and of course, the idea of listening to speakers, like you're doing right now, listening to me. We had radio, you know, in the early 20th century for exactly that purpose. And radio is a technology that has a good chance of surviving. And the question of, okay, I'll grant that the internet doesn't do much, but it's pretty much here to stay, right? You can never question that there would ever come a time where it's not going to engulf more and more of our lives. After all, the media says that the internet is going to become so big that one day, as Ray Kurzweil says, all of us are just going to be downloaded into it and live forever as disembodied virtual subjects in a constant state of drug-induced ecstasy um, on a virtual level is one of those things where nobody asks, what does it actually cost to run the internet? Now, I know that we think of the internet as being completely free, but the actual cost in terms of energy to run it is well, arguably the most expensive thing ever built by humans in terms of energy. Uh, one data center uses as much electricity as a small city. It's projected that by the year 2030, uh, one fifth of global like, electricity will be used by data centers. And that's assuming that uh, electricity uh, usage goes up indefinitely in the future because all of the economic models pre presuppose growth. But what about the possibility of reduced electricity access in the future? Uh, this is sacrilegious and unthinkable, but it's in line with the fact that it's all based on fossil fuels, which are becoming scarcer and more difficult to extract and more costly in terms of energy. And alternative energies are a scam in the sense that a solar panel cannot use more solar panels. The manufacturing of a modern solar panel requires in one form or another, hidden subsidies from fossil fuels. So you can't produce solar panels with solar panels. But even the energy you get from one solar panel is not um, new energy you get from sunlight, in addition to what it costs for you to build, transport it, etc. It's actually just about the same amount of energy you'll get from manufacturing it. It's more a storage of energy than an actual energy source. And therefore, the question becomes, can we not only sustain the internet on solar panels, if you just imagine like all of the world wide web being powered by solar panels, this fantasy, which otherwise people who otherwise should know better still promote for ideological reasons. Um, even if you grant that that's not possible and that fossil fuels are running out, um, can you imagine a scenario where people not only are um, forced not to use it because we simply can't afford it anymore or drastically reduce the amount of people who have access to it, but one in which people just willingly choose not to use it. That's the most sacrilegious perspective in Retrotopia is that they choose to go back to older technologies simply because an older one might function better. Uh, 
um, and be more satisfying than the one that replaced it. Um, for example, a shave from an electric razor is going to be intrinsically inferior to what you could get with an old-fashioned barber setup. It's going to uh, be a lot less clean of a shave. It's going to waste a lot more energy in the manufacturing process. It's going to break down quicker, uh, shelf life a couple years maybe, and it's going to make a much bigger mess to clean up. Uh, but we're told by the media that we have no choice but to accept it because it's newer. And we go along with that for almost everything. We have bread machines to cook, to bake bread that could be done by hand. It actually makes a bigger mess. It's more inconvenient to clean a bread machine than just to clean the mess from making bread from scratch. We're told by the media that we have to accept um, email over letters, even though the satisfaction of getting a letter in the mail and the depth is actually greater. We're told that we should have uh, tweets rather than in-depth discussion or in-depth analysis of political issues to get in some of the older newspapers. And the newspapers in the Lakeland Republic give this much deeper perspective rather than the shallow soundbite you get on Twitter from an article that's retweeted without anyone actually reading it. They just see if it aligns with their political ideology and they click, they click share. And the idea of Retrotopia is that far from being a living hell of squalor and misery from the Middle Ages, life without the internet goes on. In Retrotopia, people still fall in love. They make friendships. They have frustrations and fears and joys and the whole mix of experiences that that is a normal life, but they do it without internet because in so many ways, the experiences of life are your own. You don't get them from Apple or Google or whatever um, company is trying to sell you the things that you normally enjoy in life with a price tag. They're just things that you enjoy by virtue of being a human. Things people have enjoyed for thousands, millions of years without being mediated by these devices. And I'll just close with this. I remember an article in the Denver Post last year about a challenge for um, high school kids, which was actually a good one, which was to deactivate all their social media for one month. And now instead of um, just sending a friend a message on, on WhatsApp or whatever, they would actually have to get in their um, bicycle or whatever and go to that person's house, knock on the door and talk to them. And far from driving people into like a living hell of depriving them of all their social media for one month, by the end of the month, the students actually said it was a breath of fresh air. And some considered leaving social media altogether for that reason, because in a lot of ways, they got their life back. Not the life of sitting in front of a screen, just sort of staring at a little um, device in their hand, but the life of actually going out on their bicycle and experiencing things like fresh air and, and the, the, the leaves changing colors in the fall and getting to be with their friends at some real place and do things for real. It seems like the, uh, the opposite of progress, it seems like driving us back into the squalor and misery of the past, but it's actually giving us back something which most of us are desperate to get back and which you won't find just by buying this or that, you know, maybe product that's being marketed at exorbitant rates to you um, or downloading this or that service that's supposed to promise those kinds of experiences. It's going to be gotten by actually stopping for a moment and thinking about what you're doing. And the question of using older technologies like newspapers instead of, you know, internet news on Twitter, like board games instead of the Xbox. Last year, I got really interested in playing board games again, which was what I did in my childhood back in the 90s, instead of having Nintendo, Sega, anything like that, was we played board games. We played Monopoly um, and, and Checkers and and Sorry and, and Trouble and things like that and Candyland. And there's a lot more fun that you can actually have by taking an active role playing a board game rather than a passive role of staring at a screen and clicking a few buttons. Um, and the idea that you could play games of the, the complexity of, of the Xbox 360 or the Xbox One, that's actually old technology now, today, simply on the basis of the amount of energy available right now, will not go on forever. On the contrary, John Michael Brewer notes that in the 1950s, games were played on little pieces of cardboard with plastic pieces. 
because a video game would have required a machine the size of a double wide trailer. Now, obviously today that's not the case, but in the future, the actual energy required to sustain something like video games is simply not going to be available. And I'm not saying there's anything morally wrong with video games. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that the energy available to sustain it cannot be taken for granted. But maybe you'll enjoy playing old-fashioned games more anyway. The idea that somebody could enjoy um, a, an old-fashioned board game like Monopoly rather than downloading a virtual version of Monopoly to play on their phone with their friends with remote connection, rather as if that's progress, rather than just getting together in one room sitting around the table and experiencing life. Um, all of this will probably sound sacrilegious, but just stop for a moment and think about it is all I ask. Thank you.